And you're not supposed to do that. If you read the Old Testament, you cannot marry your brother's widow. That was one way then to get slightly sidetracked how Henry VIII tried to get himself divorced from Catherine of Aragon because Catherine had actually, actually been married to his older brother Arthur, who died before he could become king. So Henry VIII said, well, I can't. I can't. I can't. I, can't. I was never married to her in the first place. But in fact, he got special papal dispensation, actually from Julius II, the 15th ceiling man, um, to marry this woman. So anyway, that's, he's sort of following the letter of the law. He's John saying to, to Herod, you shouldn't have married your brother's widow. And the brother's widow, her name is Herodias, which is a little bit confusing, H-E-R-O-D-I-A-S. Uh, she, now she's got it in for John the Baptist. On Herod's birthday, his stepdaughter, the beautiful Salome, that's who we see in the foreground here, I can zoom in a bit. Whoa. Uh, she, she was the, she danced with the famous dance of the seven veils to, to entertain her stepfather, Herod. And he's so entranced by this, he said, you can have anything you want. Now, Salome doesn't know what to ask, but goes to her mother Herodias and said, what should I get? And, and Herod, Herodias, who's thinking John the Baptist, says, ask for the head of John on a silver salver. So that's the end of John Ben. There's all sorts of famous paintings to do with the beheading of St. John. So this is the actual moment of the beheading, uh, where it's fairly disgusting, isn't it? With, I mean, I'm not sure if it's anatomically correct, but I've never seen somebody was being headless. Um, anyway, and a bit of a, a sort of costume malfunction going on over here, it seems, with the execution. <laughs> so something a little bit odd with that. Got dressed in a hurry this morning, I think. And I mean, they're both a little bit disgusted because they both sort of shy away from the horror of the deed of chopping off heads. Uh, and, 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 and she, again, but look, she, she's beautifully fat. I, I, this looks to me like a French costume somewhere, just to make her extra sexy. Uh, and, and so then in the background, I'm not sure if I can zoom in, what happens back way back here, and all the nice shutters, and you've seen that sort See, there's Herod having his birthday feast. Uh, here is Salome. This is um, it's usually called continuous narrative or something, where you have you know, the same people can appear at least twice in the picture. So here she is at the front, but there she is delivering the head on the tray to uh, her mother, who then sticks a fork in it, and sometimes into the tongue just to sort of make sure he's not speaking anymore. But and this is her just getting final proof that he's actually dead. I think if you've got your, your head on a tray, you might assume that the guy is dead. But anyway, just sort of making sure. More nice aristocratic dogs and things like that. So uh, again, it's a, it's a terrific story, which is rather nicely, or uh, we'll, we'll see another example, at least one example of that in just a little bit. So uh, as I say, I, think, I just find these ones extremely effective as a, as a pictorial format, for, as, as a storytelling means of, of getting things across in an efficient kind of way. So what happens now is that he actually, I, I mentioned this when I first introduced him, he goes down to Italy in 1450. Uh, as I said, that's a jubilee year. Every 50 years, big bonus pilgrimage uh, stuff. So off he goes to Italy. And just to show you one portrait that he paints of a fellow called uh, Francesco d'Este, D apostrophe E S T E, which was one of the big families in northern Italy. So clearly, I, I mean, people like that don't commission portraits from no name. So he must have gotten himself uh, a little bit uh, somehow well known. Um, and it's a nice point, again, very simplified and straightforward. Not quite sure of the significance of the hammer and the ring. Uh, it's almost Masonic somehow. Anyway, it's just nicely kind of framed within the picture itself, kind of handsome image. But the thing is that I mentioned earlier was that, that really it, it doesn't seem to have been that affected by the trip. The one thing that does show, seem to show a little bit of um, influence from Italian art is this picture of the entombment. And it's actually, it's actually in the Uffizi, so it's still in Florence. And I don't know if there's much documentation, but if you go to Rome, unless you go by boat down the coast, you've got to go through Florence, and then why wouldn't you? You'd want to go there anyway. So this is, I mean, it's usually about 1450, but you assume he painted it actually in Italy. In fact, it was almost certainly commissioned by Cosimo de' Medici. And if you know your Italian history, you've all heard of Lorenzo the Magnificent. And Lorenzo de' Medici, who was kind of the godfather of the Renaissance in Florence, uh, his grandfather was Cosimo, who established the family fortune. And he had all these villas all around Florence. And one of them was a place called Cap.
Arreggi. And that was where Lorenzo, actually, well, Cosimo, I guess, to begin, staffed all of his philosophers. And it was, that was part of the deal. If you were a enormously rich, normally you were an aristocrat, but the Medici were kind of nouveau rich bankers and people like that. Uh, but you had your court, and at your court, as same as with the Duke of Burgundy, you had your painters and your philosophers and your musicians. But these were all on the payroll. So you had to have huge amounts of money and to be seen to be spending even more huge amounts of money to be a, a, an aristocrat at this time. And the Medici were trying to establish themselves, so part of the way of doing that was to commission works of art, works of philosophy. Because it was, I mean, well, printing comes in the middle of the century, but if you write a book of philosophy, you spent 50, 10 years to do it. At the end of that, you've got a book of philosophy. I mean, you've, it's all handwritten, you've got one bloody book. How do you earn a living with that? You can't, you've got to, be, you've got to have your patron and or do teaching. I mean, don't forget that Michelangelo is adopted, basically, by the Medici family. He lives in the Medici Palace in Florence, and he is tutored by Marsilio Ficino, who is the great Neoplatonist. And, you know, that's how Michelangelo is the best educated artist up until this point. And his schoolmate is the future Pope Leo X, who comes in after Julius II. So, I mean, this is, this is the kind of the ambience uh, in these various courts. But, Cosimo, the grandfather, seems to have commissioned this, and the picture was certainly at Correggi, the villa. Uh, for part of so people like Marcelli Vicino would have been looking at this, which is rather nice to think, before um, it ended up in the, in the Uspizi, which at its core is basically the major collection in Florence, partly in the Uspizi, partly in the Pichi Palace, uh, up the way. So anyway, this is, this is that, and it, uh, it's, it's, right, it's not that huge, it's not even quite four feet high, not much more than a metre high or so, and maybe there's it, because it's actually, I, I showed you very briefly by Fra Angelico, his Annunciation, I compared it to Robert Compan, and this, this is an Annunciation that he painted, it's still in Florence again, and, and there's enough similarity the way that the cave in the background is, it, even the way it's been sort of cut out to create the tomb space, the idea of Christ almost being presented to us with his arms flying out as if it almost still on the cross with Mary and John the Evangelist on either side and Joseph and Mary were there in behind. Similar, I mean, there's enough that he almost certainly saw that, but this is more simplified, more spiritual somehow. This is more typically northern. See, the, the Italians didn't paint in oil yet, or very, very, very few of them did. It was the northerners who developed art, and that eventually sort of trickles down into Italian art, and then you get more color, more detail, and things like that. Because, uh, you know, there's no way that Fra Angelico, maybe 20 years earlier before this, could have created something like that with, with tempera. But again, it's a, it's, a, it's a nice thing because you've got uh, similar people who we've met before, Joseph Marimuthea, Nicodemus, Mary, the mother, John the Evangelist, Mary Magdalene, big ointment jar, uh, again looking a little bit relatively emotional, uh, lots of lovely draperies and things like that. Uh, the background again, rather simplified, that's sort of Jerusalem, okay, there's actually this, this, this thinking there's, there's two ladies running along the road, and it's always said to be two Marys, you know, the Marys are coming to the tomb, I'm not sure, because, um, well again, this is sort of abstract and you can't put it into real time in any way. I think it might almost be sort of harking back to a visitation because you've got one younger and one older lady, and they do look a bit pregnant. Mind you, everybody else does too. Anyway, uh, and again, you look in here, everybody weeping away. I mean, every single one of them has tears pouring down their cheeks, which usually is horrible to look at, but gosh, it's just so good again. See, this, this is quite old-fashioned, this kind of finger in the light socket all the kind of exploding light, the, the sort of substitute for a halo in some ways. So that's a little bit old fashioned at this point, but it, it still fits in nicely, it still works. So I know that's him in Italy, but as I say, it really doesn't seem to have any major effect whatsoever, because he comes back up north and it doesn't, you know, artistically it doesn't look like he's been away at all. Just goes to keep right back on what he was doing before. Uh, so this is rather an interesting picture called the Again, it's not a superstar, so don't worry too much. Called the Pierre, Pierre Bladelin Triptych, B L A D E L I N. And it's fairly soon after the trip to Italy, it's 1452, 55, somewhere in there. 
It's about 36 inches high, so not even a metre high, uh, about 16 inches wide. It's in Berlin. And again, we're back to the area of a folding triptych. This, this is half of the things you can fold. Oh, I don't, I'm not sure what's on the back of it. I've never seen that. But what we're looking at is, I think, quite a nice integration of all three panels. And so we've got the nativity in the middle. I am, and including Pierre Vladelin, the man who paid for it, and he's shoved himself right into the middle of the picture here. And what we see in the two wings are the two sort of, um, at the same time, annunciations, if you like, to the West and to the East. I guess that's what I'm going to put. So, and the, the, the left-hand panel, again, we're back in the Arlofini bedroom, for God's sake. We've got to get out of this place. Uh, this is the... Uh, one of the Sibyls, I mentioned, we met Sibyls a tiny bit before, that they were kind of the female equivalent of Old Testament prophets. And then this is one called the Tibetine Sibyl, Sibyl, S-I-B-Y-L, who's telling the Emperor Augustus that this little baby has been born. And one of the odds there is now hovering right outside the window, this vision of the Madonna and child. And again, spiffy outfits, uh, this almost certainly is a portrait of because of the good, the Duke of Burgundy, cunningly disguised as the Emperor Augustus, who was the Emperor in Rome in the year nothing. So that's the, the Western uh, bit. Oh, look at the amazing toes and socks and everything else that could have uh, Then on the other side, you have basically it's the Annunciation to the Three Kings, to the Three Magi. And they are told to follow yonder star, basically, and they'll show up and they'll arrive in Bethlehem. Yonder star happened to be already a little uh, sort of mini Christ child who's hovering nicely up in the air. Beautiful landscape again. The three kings are always, we haven't met them that much yet, they're always identified. Well, again, see, nothing in the Bible just says three, what do they even call them? They don't call them kings, do they call them three wise men? Mm -hmm. Three wise men, yeah, three, three came from the east. Sorry. So, but eventually, you see, they get names, Caspar, Melchior, Balthazar, they get continents, but you see, one is Europe, one is Asia, one is Africa. Uh, and all sorts of legends and stories grow up, because people just didn't like the blanks, so they filled them in with all of this uh, possible stuff, basically. And they're always clearly distinguished by age. One is very old, one is middle-aged, one is quite young. Eventually, right about now, in fact, they get the idea, because very often in the entourage, you see black servants, and finally they realize, if somebody's going to sort of be representing Africa, maybe that person would be black, and so you get this absolutely amazingly beautiful portrait, I mean, you have to call it a portrait of this fellow here, because uh, you have to think, I mean, at this time, in Brussels, and, you know, Children's Day, wherever we are, racial diversity is, it's not like Toronto in year 2011, uh, where you get absolutely everything represented here. It's very, very rare to see anybody black or Asian or anything. Uh, so, but this is so real that it had to be an actual, an actual person uh, visiting a, a, again, maybe a, a servant in the retinue of some rich merchant or something visiting town. Don't know, but it's too real not to have been done from a model, basically. And again, it's quite interestingly real. So that's, that's the three kings and, and, and the wings. And what we have, the center of it, we sort of see this all a little bit familiar by this point, isn't it? Or it should be if you're staying away. Because um, we have the nativity. And, and think back again to Rob, well, combat, but it's not a huge difference from that because you've got the stable quite big and the same sort of slight angle on the foreground leading you in. Uh, in the case of Compound, you've got, I pointed out, this wonderful meandering road that leads you back. You've got the fake sun, if you like, the, the dawning of the divine light in the background, the, the new era, all that sort of thing. The ruined stable, uh, all of that kind of similar there. And then the cast of characters with, with the Madonna of Humility kneeling on the ground, dressed in white. Um, scrawny Christ child, still. Joseph with the candle. Uh, and in this case, as opposed to the, well, as I said, the sort of look like ladies in waiting, don't they? They're supposed to be the sort of um, just friends who are helping out, midwives in a sense. Uh, now you have 
let Pierre Bland land and so on. And that, I'll come back to the town itself in just a minute. So again, it's fairly con conservative, fairly traditional. I, I think in the foreground, I see there are the little, mm, I'm not going too far, little grill like things here. I think that's basically the entrance to hell. Because sometimes little devilish creatures are kind of crawling out of that space, and that's again why he has shown up glowing nicely. A um, couple of angels, the ox and the ass in the background, but the one believes, the other one doesn't. Um, well, the collar is significant. You look at this, this huge, it's almost out of place with this rather rickety stable. And the idea is, again, it's this architectural symbolism, it's the idea that the new order, Christianity, is based upon the ruins of the old, but somehow it wouldn't stand up without the ruins of the old, and this great massive support. Because the column, again, is sort of multitasking, symbol-wise, because it can be, well, it's basically, it's basically sort of symbolized fortitude, strength, power. And beyond that, again, in the sort of architectural thing, it's, it's the thing that sort of the cornerstone almost that holds up the whole building, the idea of faith itself. Uh, Christ, as we saw, remember the Arma Christi, Christ was actually tied to a column when he was beaten, flogged, uh, before the crucifixion. There was also even a legend that Mary leaned up against the column when she was giving birth to the Christ child. So that's another little... See, what, so when you saw that, if you were used to reading pictures, all of that information would be self-evident, if you like. So... Back up, the, there was a town that's quite as near ish to uh, Brussels. There's a town called Middleburg. Don't worry about it. M I D D E L B U R G. Uh, which sort of, well, I mean, basically, it should be Bethlehem in the background. Uh, but sort of the stand in for that. And, and Middleburg had been founded by Pierre Bladelin uh, just before this. And Philip, he, he had been Philip the Good's treasurer. I guess maybe sort of taking over from uh, Nicholas Roland. And the similar sort of thing, you know, with the guilty conscience, so you do things. So he actually built the town, he must be really guilty, and built the church of St. Nicholas. I mean, that's sort of, in a way, his name saint. Uh, and the castle here, we know, was begun in 1448 at the church. No, I'm sorry, did I say Nicholas? St. Saint Peter, St. Saint, Saint Pierre, uh, began in 1452. And this painting was to be the altarpiece in the church. So you're in the church, you're looking at the painting, and there in the painting is the church that you're in. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so and all that works rather nicely uh, together. So again, it, all of this stuff, modern dress, modern, you know, the, the, the landscape, the cityscapes, whatever behind, all of that brings things close to home, makes it relevant. It's not just some old history lesson, it's sort of still perpetual truth that we see in these uh, images. And again, I don't think there's anything going on. It's a little bit like a bit behind. Well, there's another doctor's office. See right there. Uh, so a little bit like the sort of schematic way of showing the time we saw on the back of St. Luke drawing the Virgin. And whether or not there's anything like, I've never Googled Middleburg to try to find out and see if it's right. It's rather a sympathetic portrait of presumably quite a crooked fellow. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. So the last thing I want to show you, and this is again, it's a highlight superstar kind of picture, just because it's so stunningly beautiful. And again, over and over again, don't have to be religious to like this sort of thing. It's just so well done and put together, uh, and grand in scale, conception, and everything. And it's usually called either the Columba, C-O-L-U-M-B-A, altarpiece, or sometimes the St. Columba altarpiece, 1460, 62, something like that. It's about well, four and a half feet high or so. The side wings are a bit over two feet wide. So, I mean, they're not huge, but this is in Munich. And actually, one of the versions of, remember the St. Luke drawing the Virgin, is in Munich as well. And certainly last time I was there, which was quite a while ago, I was touring people around again, and the two of them were side by side. And you just go nuts because, they, again, they're the real things to talk about rather than... Uh, I, I finally got permission to take groups through the Louvre in Paris and the, and the Musée d'Orsay. And I told people, it's like you die and you go to heaven. And Peter says, well, hello, and would you mind preaching the sermon on Sunday? Because there you are with all your lovely old friends. Because however good that is, it's not the real thing. 
So anyway, here is his extraordinary about Goethe, who you all know, this great German romantic writer. Uh, he went on and on about this, but a wonderful thing it was, and uh, the only thing he got wrong is he thought it was by her night. Because it, it, it really is a re pretty reasonably that people sorted out between the various artists of this century. Anything that was sort of old and colourful and sort of 15th century, it was sort of by Van Eyck, basically. So what we're looking at, again, so we've sort of seen this idea before, kind of three of the joys of the Virgin when she's closest to crisis. And one is the Annunciation, one the Adoration of the Magi, and one is the presentation of Christ in the Temple. So we'll, we'll sort of explain that as we go along. So in the left-hand wing, a fairly simplified Annunciation uh, with this wonderful kind of hover um, Gabriel, quite simply dressed, well at least in white, with little sort of uh, bejeweled bits and pieces. Uh, and he's coming through the Porta Clausa, the, the locked gate basically, got all these symbols of Mary's uh, purity. Uh, and again, he doesn't carry the lilies, but they're on the ground in front of him. He's saying, behold the handmaid of the Lord. Down with the Holy Spirit, zooming in just to make sure everything is working out. We're still in the Almofini bedroom, I have to say. Beaten up cushion in the background. Oh, no bottle of glass. Oh, well, that's all right. Uh, a lovely little rose window up there with very beautiful decorative glass. And, and again, the, the idea of Mary just quietly, she's been reading the good book. I, said, I think I said it's almost only Isaiah, the idea that she's reading him because he's the one who talks about a virgin birth, so that relates. Uh, the fact that they don't have books yet, that's okay as well. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure how much I can zoom in, but actually on the pre-Jersey, see there's Adam and Eve under the tree of knowledge with the serpent coiling around it, if you can see that a little bit. So that's rather nicely done, but fairly, fairly straightforward. The central panel, though, gets really quite complex, and there's one thing in this that you have to see one thing that shouldn't be there. I gave it away a little bit by saying that, but uh, look carefully, see what you can see. So the idea of the adoration of the Magi, this is royalty. So this is a good thing for grand people to sort of associate themselves. In fact, it was very common for, uh, well, even, even in front of the Magi, there was something called the Company of, of, of the Magi, which was like the Order of the Gold, it was sort of a gentleman's club, basically. So if you were anybody in Florida, you had to be a member of this thing. And if you know, there's a particularly famous series of images relating to the, the, the journeys of the Magi, the three kings, in the Medici palace, with a portrait of young Lorenzo as the youngest of the three Magi. So it, it wasn't out of the ordinary to do that sort of thing. And I showed this a couple of weeks ago when I was talking about the, uh, the just, you know, sort of the good, and then his son, Charles the Bold, who is actually shown as the youngest of the three kings. Uh, and again, in this very, very elegant, aristocratic quality, uh, doffing his hat, again, sort of echoing real good manners, if you like, as if you came into the presence of the queen. In the real world, you would take the hat off, obviously, and you would remove your spurs and things like that. I mean, he hasn't done that quite yet. An unbelievably nice aristocratic doff. So again, this, in a sense, it's kind of harking back to the good old days of the international Gothic style, which was all very arrogant, but these are now flesh and blood, blood creatures. Look at, look at the twist in the tie of that body, it's unbelievably beautiful. It's almost choreographed, it's almost balletic, somehow. So you get him standing up, him a little bit more kneeling down the middle one, all with their Christmas presents, of course. And then the oldest of the three, he's not that keen, is he, having his hand, you know, little kid. Sometimes he sort of really gives it cap on the head, which is nice. He's got the best hat I think I've ever seen in the, from this period. And again, I think all of you, if you're in the fashion business, you should, I've said this before, steal ideas from good old pictures. Well, that would look good walking down the street, wouldn't it? Well, maybe not. Uh, and again, sort of modest looking Mary, the, the, you can see through to the town of Bethlehem in the background, uh, but basically the whole stable kind of blocks things off. Even the uh, the back of the uh, of the ox, some of the ox believes ass doesn't. That sort of keeps you keeps your eye in the foreground. A little bit like in the in the compound that I just showed again, the idea of a kind of the door, the sun rising above the, the, the ruined stable, 
the architectural symbol at the dawning of the new era. Not sure who that is, probably the, the son of the patron who ever paid for it. We don't know who did. And there's old Joseph again. He hasn't got a candle for one, but again, he's looking pretty decrepit uh, as he comes in here. So again, a lot of good stuff to look at, but um, and, and again, onlookers, we'll see stranger representations of this kind of thing a little bit later on. But he is the most striking, powerful figure. Just, I mean, he really is real in everything. Have you, have you, have you noticed what shouldn't be here? The crucifixion? Very good, the crucifixion. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, he's just showing up and there he is up on the wall behind. <laughs> so again, you kind of put Alpha Omega at the beginning and the end of his life. Uh, all in the one thing, as we've seen before with parrots and various other birds that show up. Um, just kind of rounding out the story, I guess, a little bit. So that, I think he's just terrific. Uh, and and then, see, not really that would be the shepherds showing up, but they actually got there, remember, before the kings. I don't think that is them. Uh, so the, the final panel is... It's a scene called the Presentation. Presentation of Christ in the temple. And that, as I said, that was kind of, in a way, the first ritual in a, in a Jewish child's life. If you were taken to the temple, you would bring gifts. That, uh, they got a bucket load of little doves or something to give to the temple. And he's being handed it. There's, there's Joseph still carrying the candle. Sort of a, because I'm not quite sure why there's a beggar. It looks like a beggar with his hat there, but maybe he's just a little bit like in the back of the way or not. Remember the fellow standing hat in hand, just suggesting holy ground. Uh, the two characters here, there was a, an old priest called Simeon. Again, this is biblical stuff. And an old priestess called uh, Anna. And little Christ are there. I don't remember. Well, he's Christ, so he should know that in about five minutes he's going to be circumcised, but he's not looking that bothered about things. And a couple of other sort of onlookers in this absolutely lovely Romanesque, light filled space in behind the figures. It's just beautifully done. And he's probably very good at doing it. I mean, it's hard to paint architecture without making it really boring, just sort of straight lines and hard edges. So uh, the sense of actual light coming in here is rather good. Now, my big mystery, though, is who the hell is this? Because, I mean, that, that, she, she's so damn beautiful, and she's sort of, she's really saying, look at me. She's got this incredibly, we saw that on Mary Magdalene a while ago, that particular kind of headdress with this amazing hat, with that pigtail hair sort of coming down the back of that as well. This very, very rich clothes, you can see. It was quite common to have sort of layering of clothes that you could sort of formed off, you know, different levels of, you know, showing through from one level to the other. Uh, it's, again, it's not the best dog, if I can zoom in on the whole thing there, but it's a pretty good little one. Um, anyway, I mean, the point is that she is very distracting, because when you're looking at the scene, uh, and however significant it is, you keep coming back and looking at her, because she's just too lovely. Uh, and that's the trouble sometimes. I mean, lots of artists in Italy are doing it the same thing. Maybe if you've seen me doing something like Ghirlanda Iom in very, very serious scene, and then somebody in the corner, somebody's just doing something unbelievably, wonderfully beautiful, just standing there and give Berti on the gates of paradise. It just takes your mind off what it should be. Thinking about. So, my theory is, and there's a tiny possibility that I might be wrong, but I think that this is uh, the, the mistress. Uh, of the, the prince who we just saw inside, well, not quite the prince, but, Ch but Charles the Bold. And remember the historical stuff, Charles was, he's, he's actually not quite uh, the Duke of Burgundy yet, he's you know, going to wait maybe five years or so until his father dies, then he'll be the Duke, but then he's killed in 1477, and that's kind of the end of the Duchy of Burgundy, basically. But what happens is, what you have to imagine is that this is a folding altarpiece. Uh, and so when you fold that over there and that over there, these two then, whoa, see, they become, a, even the doggies get to sort of hang out together. <laughs> uh, and in fact, we'll see another example later, not with any sort of skullduggery, but by memory when we get to it in, in sort of a week from today. Uh, a 
again, it's a, it's a, it's a diptych with the, the, the fellow in one panel and the Madonna around the other one, but again, you have to close them up, and there's a pretty nose to it. So I think this is his, his secret love interest. Uh, that would be a very, because if he's there, I mean, presumably he's telling Roger to put him there as the youngest of the three kings. So presumably he's also telling Roger to put this absolutely lovely lady in as well. Uh, an extra 50 bucks to put her in somehow. Uh, because um, Charles, he actually had a nice English wife, so you're not going to bring your wife in a sort of secret situation like that, I don't think. So uh, I'm, I'm guessing this is the girlfriend. It makes it much more, much more interesting that way. Uh, but what I mean, I'll, I'll sort of, I'll not quite prove it, but I'll show you something in just a second. But just to summarize uh, Roger himself, because I think there is, I mean, if you want to start using words like superficial, sort of in a good sense of the word, because a lot of Roger is up on the, on the, on the sort of, just the surface of the picture, just the, the visual delight in looking at, at, at the colors and the material and things like that. But also, as I said, he is uh, more accessible than something like uh, um, and I, I would think almost he's more influential because more artists can sort of look to him and borrow from him than they could at, 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 from Van Eyck, who's a little bit more remote uh, somehow. So what you get and what we see is when we'll pick up after the midterm is a kind of general process of sort of thinning out of detail, simplification of, even of ideas, not even as much symbolism in some of the later ones. So, in fact, the next generation almost takes the easy way out, I think you would have to say. Uh, there's less substance, there's less thought on the part of the artist, so there's less thought on the part of us uh, as well. We don't need to know as much to appreciate what's going on in these pictures. Because that's what, I mean, I've almost been, I guess, overdoing it, explaining. Because, you know, when these pictures were painted, you didn't need someone like me to stand there going on and on and on about what's happening, because people knew. You're not, you know, you're not trying to... Uh, invent anything or be, you know, sort of sneaky clever. You're just painting common knowledge, uh, basically. So what we have to see is the next artist, so I'll just show you very good, and then we'll just talk a little bit about the midterm. One question, what, yeah. what's the meaning of the, the, there's been twice I've seen a guy wearing a white stocking and a red stocking? Oh, uh, I guess just sexy fashions. Is there one in here? Mm, Was yeah, white red? Next, on the Certainly the right one beheading, beheading the guy with that. Oh, in the background? Yeah. And the guy who we had it on the... Yeah. Just no, I, don't, I think it might be just... The fashion. Or they were just sloppy dresses. No, you're right. See, red and white. Maybe it's... Yeah. Anybody know the history of fashion? I mean, that the, was probably quite common to mix and match. Because Punch, maybe. Looks pretty good. I mean, who decided we had to wear the same, same socks all the time? Somebody without very much imagination. But if you turn up with different socks, everybody says, oh, what happened to you this morning? So, I don't know. Um, I don't think it's all that significant, to be honest. But you could, you could write an effort. That could be your essay. You could do some serious research. So let me just show you quickly. I'll just show you briefly uh, the next artist that we're going to pick up on, um, who is uh, Hans Memling, who's actually technically, I guess, in some ways German, but that's all right. Uh, and so, because he does things like, uh, I mean, he, 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 almost sort of, sometimes almost sort of knockoffs from, uh, from Roger. And this is just to show one scene of his presentation. Uh, I mean, there's sort of a pretty girl in the background, but, but not really that sort of pushed into the foreground. Certainly, if you folded things up, nothing too exciting would happen. And see, so here's another one again, which is quite similar to, the, but, in, you know, but very different uh, from Roger. And again, you've got the, the, the adoration made a, 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 a really lovely, elegant, black, youngest of the kings there. And then the, here's a much more traditional presentation where you've got Joseph, Mary, Anna, Simeon. No sexy lady at all. Uh, but clearly this one derives from uh, Roger. So for memory, it was there was no relevance to having sexy mistresses added in. Okay, so I, I rest my day. So, midterm, well, I know you're all keen to find out. This is more or less repeating what, uh, what I've said. And I still don't know, I haven't thought about it that hard yet. First thing just there to say is do try to be on time. You don't want to start on time, and then it'll be maybe an hour, a little bit. Uh, if you are ESL, you're allowed to bring a dictionary, uh, but it should be uh, not a digital.
digital dictionary. I don't want to see you all out there kind of googling things. Uh, an actual thing on paper. Uh, I mean, technically, this, I mean, I, I hate to do it just because there were a few bad students who cheated like mad. I mean, I have to be much more careful than I used to be. I mean, technically, I should make you leave all your stuff up at the front and leave your cell phones at home and things like that. I won't quite do that. That's not quite fair. But I mean, I just don't. I mean, I've shown you already today what will happen to you if you cheat. So it's, it's not worth it because it might be true. So there. Um, Anyway, so the, 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 the paper, because this place is so cheap now, it doesn't provide those nice little books for the midterm, so I, I'm hoping they'll have lots of just that nasty yellow paper. And so you write the exam on that. Um, you can use lots of it, so don't cram everything into one little tag on one sheet of paper, just to sort of spread. Now remember, somebody's going to read it all, so your handwriting is kind of important, and it doesn't matter if you say wonderful things. If the TA can't read your writing, then it doesn't help all that much. Uh, when there are sort of essay-ish kinds of questions, you can use point form, but they have to be kind of sensible. Well, sometimes, again, it's, I, don't, I don't think there's going to be a comparison because there's just too many good individual things. But if there is a comparison, some people sort of draw a line down the middle and then compare from one side to the other. But they always kind of stop and they just basically write one side and then the other side. So you might as well just do it. Consecutively. Uh, anyway, the, the first part, as I said, would be basically straight identification. So, well, it wouldn't be that because we haven't got that far yet. Uh, and get your highlight sheet. And I mean, if, if it were that one, you would say Roger Saint Luke drawing the Virgin and give a date of 1435, whatever. Uh, and people say, oh, do we have to memorize all the names? Well, yeah, you do. Because there aren't that many to begin with. And, I mean, however sort of pedantic is, I'm data really useful. Because if, if you think that Braget came before Compare or he did this before Compare, then you're not sort of following the plot. So what I always used to do, because I was just, I was sick in the head, I used to draw endless lists. In fact, my whole apartment then, it was papered with all my lists. And I would have sort of, 1450 or something would go around the room like that and all the pictures by the various artists would be sort of running around so I could read along it and see exactly who did this when and everybody else, you know, even north and south of the Alps and things like that. So that, you don't have to go, go quite that to. I did mention in the very first class that I think it is a good idea to get a study buddy to sit with somebody and ask them questions, test yourself, things like that and just sort of try, try each one of you to remember what the hell I was talking about. Um, but anyway, as I say, the first part is just fairly straightforward, factual stuff. Uh, and then the second part, there will be, again, I can't be absolutely sure, probably two images, one after the other. I don't think there'll be a comparison, but you never know. Uh, and then it will be, uh, and again, it will be highlight sheet stuff. Uh, there's nothing that isn't on the highlight sheet, and there's nothing, in fact, the, the main things in part one, even will be the ones that were in capital letters. So that doesn't give me a huge amount of choice. Um, but say, for example, it were that one. Well, I'm not saying it is, but it might. Um, that, I mean, first of all, what it said is that we're in part two, number one. So this is the first image to come up. So first of all, you have to identify it the way you did it in the first bit. So you have to do the Jan van Eyck the Madonna of Canon kind of George van der Parler in 1432, 34, something like that. See, I don't have to remember dates anymore, but you do. Uh, and then you just go nuts. You describe it in as much detail as you can. First of all, if I were you, I would talk, say a little bit about Jan van Eyck himself, uh, about how he just finished the Ghent Altarpiece and you know, a few other little interesting details like that. I would also discuss medium, just the idea of oil painting. Is, cannot imagine this in any other medium whatsoever. I mean, now there's more modern chemical things, but don't forget that using pretty basic stuff, and, and as I said, the oil is just the what you mix the colours with, if you mix them with tempera, same basic colours, which are mostly organic, vegetable or mineral 
Uh, so you mix it with oil, you mix it with egg, whatever, and, and, and you get very, very different results. Uh, so this is the perfection of technique, which allows you to do this extraordinary amount of detail. So you would talk about some of the detail, and you would sort of basically run around the picture describing what you see. I mean, sort of the way that I've been doing it. So you would say about our child, you would just, you would say about the parrot, you would talk about bottle glass, you would talk about the beauty of the canopy, of the, all this floral stuff above her head, the carpeting beneath her, the heavy robes. Remember that that reflects the textile industry in this particular area. Because um, we're in Bruges, remember at this point. Uh, the sculpture on the throne, Cain killing Abel, Samson killing that lion, Adam even below that. Then, then talk about St. Don Donation, from his T-I-A-N, not I-O-N. A little bit about who he was and why he's carrying this silly wheel with candles on it. And remember, it's in his church that we're in, basically. And then, then you talk a bit about St. George, a tiny bit about who he was and how he's behaving when we're doffing his helmet in the presence of the Queen. Uh, and then a little bit about Canon George and just how he's painted with all that extraordinary, meticulous detail. And you might even throw in that little story about all the doctors who came and saw this and diagnosed him with melanoma. Uh, and it'd be interesting to actually to, to check the documents if there are and to see actually how he died if he did die of cancer. Uh, and in all of that, and then on and on, and you might mention, remember I pointed out the self-portrait that's reflected in the armor way in the corner, the threads, I mean everything that I sort of said that makes, to me anyway, the picture interesting more than just kind of some quickly understandable thing. And I'm not saying for saying that it is this picture, but that's the approach you have to take. Uh, to, to, and, and all the symbolism of why you can't really talk about the flowers. Um, the, I mean, if that were up again, you'd have even more about the symbolism here of the candle, the asparagus, the margaret, the apples, the dogs, the shoe. I mean, on and on and on. There's as much symbolism here, as I said, about uh, as there is in a real religious picture and what it means, if it, if it is a wedding, do a little bit of reading about it, come up with other opinions, perhaps, uh, because there are at least 3,962 different interpretations. But of course, remember, my, what my one is the right one, so there. Uh, just for now, it doesn't have to be next Tuesday, but by next, for next Monday it is. Uh, I'm just, again, the skill level, of, of what, I mean, always going the extra mile, and why you have that amazing chandelier when you could have put a simple one in. Uh, the meaning of the reflection, the legalese handwriting. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. There is two pair of shoes, the woman's Yeah, shoes. that's hers. Yeah. She's got little red sandals, and he gets these cloggy looking, oh, they look very it. uncomfortable, don't they? Um, and remember, that was holy ground. God telling Moses to take off his shoes. Oh, yeah, that's In the burning bush story. Yeah. If you Google Moses, you can Google Moses burning bush, you'll find out about that. Uh, she's not pregnant, remember. Who they are, maybe, probably. I mean, again, there's just so much to talk about and think about. And the, and the other one, I mean, it could be any of these ones, again, in, in the camp. The, I mean, there has to be something about the against all the people. So do a huge amount of work on that. Do as much reading and thinking as possible you can about that. Uh, things like the May Road, all the reasons. Well. I mean, the trouble is that, that, that there's not. I mean, there's only like. Well, as I said, the, the, the part two will be two things like this and another one, and then part three. I like to give you a choice. So the part two you have to do both bits, uh, and part three there'll be maybe four choices. But one of the choices will be picture on the wall, so there's always a visual aid, but then uh, the other one might be sort of, you know, generalized essay-ish type questions uh, about general ideas that I've been talking about in this course. Uh, nearly everybody does the visual one, because that's the sort of easy, you can keep looking at it and anything you forget is right there, so you can't forget really. So any questions, worries, problems? You can Google me over the... Now, there's some people... Are you all having trouble with the... 
old canon, um, the, the, the email. Because no. if you write to me, I can't reply for some reason in my email. I have to go then go into my courses. And a couple of you have written to me recently, and I've had to sort of go a bit sideways. So I, is, is it only me? No, I got your email after you written. Yeah, that was, that was back a while. But I think yeah, I think with I you, I had to go back into my courses rather than just reply to the email. Because if I write a nice reply to the email, I hit send. That little red thing comes up. Yeah, and I, got it, I got it in my courses. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But not a bit, oh, maybe you don't do email in, in the old camp one. That's smart of you. <laughs> um, so anyway, it's a little bit difficult for me sometimes to reply, so um, I'll, I'll try my best anyway. But if you do have a, actually this is a good thing to say, if you, if you do have a question for me before Monday, uh, ask me the question, but also send me a phone number and I'll call you. It's easier doing it that way than trying to write a line answer on email that's not working. It's only the ones that are in capital. Only capital letters, yeah. I can't be much more specific than that because that narrows it down a fair bit though. But the third part, you said you third part is that there's a choice of, but it would be one, hmm? one out of four. One out of four. Probably one out of four. four. Or maybe one out of three. I'm not okay. Depends how many clever questions I've come up with. Um, how long is it supposed to be there? Well, the whole, the whole exam will be a little bit more than an hour. So each of the, well, I, I never quite know what to do because, you know, the, the part two one, when you're going to write about the picture, some of you, I, I look up, some of you are finishing five minutes. And others, I give you 20 minutes, and you're still frowning to writing at the end. Then I have to give you more time at the end of the exam. At the end of 20 minutes, you're still writing away. So the trick is, you don't have to say absolutely everything that you know. I mean, you can be, you can be a little bit selective. But part of the exercise is to kind of fuss up a little bit of my don't. As soon as you see anything, don't start scribbling and writing away. Do little sort of notes on a piece of scrap paper. Just, you know, put a few headlines down. Just organize your thoughts. The crucial things you want to talk about. Put them in a proper, a good order, rather than just rambling on. Uh, and that allows you, I think, to sort of, you know, condense your ideas perhaps a little bit better. So as I said, I never know exactly how much time to give you because other people just, some people just get completely bored and have to sit there for 20 minutes waiting for everybody else. But is there an amount like two pages? Or like well, whenever you can write, it depends on how fast you write. That's like, you know, how long it takes to paint this picture. You know what the answer to that is? How long do you think it took to write? That's the good teacher answer. You throw the question right back to the person who asked it. If you don't think you have no idea what the answer is, you just say, well, how long do you think? That's a useful one for your later careers. Is somebody waving arms? Yeah. Do you need to know, like, exact sizes? No, no sizes no, size are really good enough just for your own kind of conception of these. Because uh, everything I've shown you has been exactly that size. That's the trouble. Even if it's this big or ten, three times bigger than that, it's always constant on them. And, and, and so the, I mean the, the real one of this is smaller than that, but not a whole lot smaller. That one my Raj I showed you the last time today was about as wide as the room. Um, but no, you don't have to put size. I used to have size and medium and where the thing is as, as questions. And, uh, people got angry at me for that. <laughs> but I mean, it, it, I, one thing I always find is rather interesting that, that you lot as artists, you, can, well, you can't memorize anything because you have no memory glue anymore. And you don't have to memorize anything, you can just Google it and look it up again. You know, I bet none of you were forced as children, this is child abuse, I think, to memorize pages and pages of poetry. Do, do you still do that a bit? Not really. I mean, all, you know, boys stood on the burning deck and then just dreadful stuff. But it, it actually trained your memory to keep things. I mean, I can't remember anything else now, but it worked back right then. Uh, but so I, th I find that you lot, you, can, you cannot remember things that well. But I've also talked for a long time at the, at the Royal Contemporary of Music. And they, I mean, first of all, those guys have talent. And I have no idea if you have talent. Because if somebody plays the piano or sings, you know immediately if they're flat or incompetent. And it's harder to judge. Uh, but they can memorize things, because from the age of four, I mean, you, you, they, they're they able to sit down and play page and page of music faultlessly, you know, without any kind of reference to a sheet of music in front of them. So they, their memory muscles work better than you are. 
that they've had to do it. So it's just a question of practice. I bet even some of you could memorize and remember things if you tried. But I bet you remember something. But I remember baseball statistics and things like that, which I really shouldn't because they're totally useless. Uh, but some things taken. I try to remember. I cannot remember my kids' phone numbers. Nothing. There's no glue there whatsoever. I don't remember. I don't know my own phone. My cell phone number. I haven't a clue. Four. It's got a four in it somewhere. Uh, anyway, so that's enough of that. So, have you got any other? Have you got any other questions right now that might be useful for everybody? Yeah. Uh, no, I just just sort of go back up. and if, if Robert's got all the stuff up on, on the podcasting, that'd be helpful as well. Um, so, so when, when can people start looking at a sort of finished product? Um, I don't know. What time is it? Tomorrow? <laughs> to- tomorrow, that's tomorrow night. Yeah. That's amazing. And you're going to owe him big money at the end of this course. <laughs> yeah. uh, sort of twenty bucks each minimum. <laughs> Buy me a beer. Just go and relax and have a nice time. Don't just for God's sake, don't worry about it because then that.